This is the big one, folks. The one we've all been waiting for, the one you've been waiting for. This is the full tour of my ultimate template. The one that I use to score all of my projects, specifically set up to house pretty much every sound that I use at a moment's notice. This is gonna be a long one. In this video, I'll go over the organization of it, how it's set up, special settings that I have that you should know about. And then in the next video, we're going to go over all of the routing and mixing for this template because that's a huge part of it and it's pretty complex as well. So that'll be in the next video. So stay subscribed. I'll also post another video after that showing how I use the entire template in context using both the organization and the mixing. I have a video where I make the case for templates and how I use mine that I made previously that you should check out. I also will not be going in depth about the sample libraries that I have in here. I've already made a video on the sample libraries that I use in my template, again, linked. If you want to download this template for yourself, for Logic Pro, it's made available to all score level patrons over on Patreon. So go and check it out, link in the description if you're interested in downloading this template for yourself. I will also add chapter marks in this video so you can easily reference, but I do recommend the first time through watching this whole thing so you don't miss anything. Okay, enough housekeeping out of the way. Go ahead and grab a drink, grab a snack, relax, take notes, and let's get into the tour of my ultimate template. Okay, so this is my template as you see it every time that I launch it. This template is designed to be flexible and efficient. Everything I use is up and ready to go and I can easily add or delete sounds as I see fit. So to start off with, I'll go from top to bottom here in the main arrange window. The global tracks that I have set up here, marker, movie, signature, and tempo. I have a few markers already in here. We'll go more in depth on what those mean and what they're for later. Right under that, we have a folder here titled DX, SFX, and temp. This holds pretty much three separate tracks for dialogue. DX stands for dialogue in sound design land. Dialogue sound effects, and for a temp track in case you have a certain piece of music that you're referencing or this temp track came from a director or editor for you to focus on. This is muted by default, but if you requested the dialogue and sound effects on different tracks, you can house them here and mute them or solo them as you need to. Under that, we have something called MX monitor. MX in sound design land stands for music. This houses two tracks your mix monitor and your mastered monitor. We'll go more in depth of how this is set up, but mostly you'll be listening to your mix monitor. So you don't have to open that folder often. Right under that, we have a track called Sketch. This already has a region in it. And if you double click on this region, it'll take you into a separate sort of project within a project, which in Logic is called a pack folder. You see, I have four sketch tracks here. The first one is muted by default, but in here you can write any ideas that you may have down, record it, and then later on orchestrate it to all of your parts afterwards. The way I recommend you enter this from the template that I've set up personally is by pressing the number three, but we'll talk more about that a little later. Going back to our main window, after th this section at the top, we get into the actual instruments themselves. This top half are all of the orchestral instruments, all the in instrumental families from woodwinds, brass, percussion, harp and keys, choir and strings. Under that, I have a track here, empty track called non-orchestral. Everything underneath this point are non-orchestral instruments. So. One can think of these as prelays, though I don't, I wouldn't call them that here because maybe you would want to record a guitar or drums. Focusing on the orchestral instruments first, this is organized in orchestral order, which is what I prefer with the woodwinds at the top and the strings at the bottom. Each family of instruments is in its own summing stack. So if I open up this folder, you see all of my woodwind instruments here that are already pretty much organized by articulation or playing technique. You may know that I use the BBC Symphony Orchestra as my main orchestral sounds. So that's what this is all filled up with. Now, these summing stacks, for example, this one titled 0, 100 woodwinds. This will end up being a stem that will be printed. Each stem is made up of what I call sub mixes, and there are four of them per stem. Let me show you what that means. Certain articulations are routed to one of these four that you see here. Winds long, winds short, winds effects, or winds 
solo. All of the instruments with long style playing are routed to the winds long. All the woodwinds with short style playing are routed to winds short. Winds effects is for unorthodox playing or aleatoric techniques or atonal techniques and rips and such. Wind solo is for just a single instrument that maybe needs to be a little bit more present in the mix because it's not a part of the ensemble. Each of these sub mixes can be printed on their own or as a group in one woodwinds stem. Something I hadn't mentioned, one of my favorite parts about this template is that it's completely set up to not only write music quickly and efficiently because all the tracks are there and ready to go and I don't have to search for each instrument that I want to use and then load it up, but everything is routed so that I can print 24-bit files that are broadcast ready to be sent and break it down from a full mix print to stems, to sub mixes, etc. You can even print the click very easily with the template. Again, I'll go over that soon. So each stack of instruments is laid out pretty similarly. So here's the brass, here are all the brass instruments that I use, and the sub mixes are broken down in the same way. Most of the stacks are laid out in the way that I showed you with the woodwinds, where there's a sub mix specifically for the longs, the shorts, the effects, and the solos. Similarly, the choir is set up this way. So you can see here, choir long, choir short, choir effects, and choir solo, which I guess would just be a singer or a vocal track. You'll also see here that I have the sopranos, alto, tenors, basses, and the whole choir section organized in folders. This is actually part of an update that came out as I'm recording this yesterday where you can put folders inside of folders and I immediately jumped on it. I backed up my entire system, backed up Logic, and then updated. So here are the soprano tracks, the alto tracks, etc. Lastly, here in orchestral, we have all of my strings. Here are all of the articulations here, along with strings long, strings short, strings pits, colenio, and strings effects. I also have a folder up here for all of the leaders. So this is the first violin leader, second violin leader, etc. Before the nested folders feature, I just had all of these all in one under the strings track. And it's just, it amounts to so many tracks that you're looking at at once that it gets really just overwhelming. Now, let's talk a little bit about the sub mixes. So I mentioned that all of the tracks of a similar type are routed to one sub mix. Here's the strings long sub mix. This right here, has a few channel strip effects on it that I like to use. Basically, I have an EQ that is corrective, an EQ that is for color to pretty much sweeten up the entire submix. And I, in this case, also have a multiband compressor. More on that in the next video. This also sends to a reverb. So if you look here on the side, I have a long verb, a short verb, and three effects tracks ready to go. You can send any of these submixes to those effects tracks, and then both the submix and the effects tracks are routed to the stem track, which you can then print as its own stem with all of the effects added on, like reverbs. When you print just the submix, you're printing it without the effects. So if you have a reverb that you're sending from a submix, if you print that submix itself, it won't have the reverb on it. And this is customary in case you ever have a dedicated score mixer. They will probably want to use their own reverb. Their reverb is probably better than your reverb. So it's customary not to print the effects when you print just the uh, submix. The submix is what I, I'm calling it, but I've also heard this layer of mixing, if you will, to be the synth master. Another thing I'd like to mention in terms of how the whole template is organized mixing wise, each individual instrument might have an EQ on it. For example, let's open this violin one. This channel EQ is just cutting out some of the low end, just to cut out some of the room rumble that you might get when you're using so many samples at a time, that noise just starts to build up. You don't have to do it with live recordings, but when samples are being triggered back and forth from different instruments that can really build up. Pretty much on every single orchestral instrument, I have what I'm calling a corrective EQ. I'm just cutting out frequencies that are not beneficial to the full mix. I'm not boosting anything. Over on the submix, however, so the strings long track will have all of the long violins, all of the long violas, 
celli, and basses routed to this track. This track has another corrective EQ here at the top. I can't remember how I came to, to this specifically, but I just found that for the full ensemble, cutting those frequencies made a big difference. Under that, however, I have what I call a color EQ. So this is what the EQ looks like just when I pull it up on its own. These are not the settings that I use, but the settings that I do use, I got from Trevor Morris, who I'm happy to be able to call a mentor of mine. He shared what he uses on his on his tracks, and he asked us not to share this because that's a part of his sound. So out of respect for him, I won't share exactly what EQ settings I'm using, but if you use an EQ like this, this is the API 550A, there are only three bands that you can change. So play around with it to really sweeten up your, your sub mix sound. Again, we'll go over that in the routing and mixing video. Moving along in the organization of the template, down to the non-orchestral side, I have a few stems here. The first one, leads, arps, and bass. This stem is made up of four submixes, leads, arps high, arps low, and basses. The way I'm thinking about it, leads are everything that maybe is a synthesized pluck sound or a key sound or uh, a long typical lead synth sound. Arps high are synths that are arpeggiated or are pulses or that reoccur over and over again. Arps low is the same, but on the low end. This is broken up like this because they're kind of treated differently in terms of a full mix. Under that, I have a basses folder. So all of my basses, which are not necessarily ARP basses, that's what ARP's low is for, but sustained notes or maybe a lead line that's played in a bass register. All of that, again, is fed into a leads, ARPs, and bass stem. Then we go into pads and drones. Pads high is pretty much anything that's sustained up high on the keyboard. Pads low is the same, but low on the keyboard. Drones is specifically for maybe a layer or a synth sound that sustains, but is kind of, it isn't a pad. So its main purpose is to kind of add a, a little bubbly layer underneath or to add a bit of atmosphere or ambiance. That's what the drones stack is for. Under that, we have textures. Textures, I consider it to be sort of like a drone in which it's sustained and happens over time. However, textures are non-tonal. So maybe it's something that uses wind effects more, more on the sound design side of things. That's what I consider textures to be. All of this is fed into the pads and drones stem. After that, I have what I call hits and effects. Under the hits folder, I have pretty much just really big uh, cinematic drums, things that are really impactful. These aren't orchestral. These are sounds that are very processed. These are usually in my book, used for effects, not necessarily something that you want to treat in the same way that you would treat an orchestral instrument or even an orchestral percussion instrument. I've got metals. This is basically more hits, but with a metallic sound to them. Booms might just be low subsonic impacts or uh, very reverberant booms and such like that. And then effects is kind of reserved for whooshes and risers and more of the sound design type of stuff. Under that, I've got guitars. Uh, it's broken up between small guitars, which are like charangos or maybe like a ukulele or something like that. Acoustic guitars, which are full bodied guitars, but are acoustic, electric guitars and bass guitars. I've been asked before by an engineer to separate out the bass guitar tracks into its own separate stem, which is common. Maybe I would make a separate bass uh, stem, dedicated stem, but I'll, I'll go into what I did to accommodate that request. Finally, I have the drums stem. This is broken up into small percussion, which is basically non-orchestral percussion, but things like shakers or little triangles that are treated differently than in an orchestral context. Hand drums, things like uh, tablas or congas or bongos, things like that. Beats are basically just electronic drum sounds. So anything from a drum machine, basically I would leave in the beats category, uh, have an 808 in there, stuff like that. And then kits. Kits is a full 
drum set sounds basically. So those are all of my stems. There are 11 in total. And you'll also notice this 12th one that I have called wild card. This is an empty stem basically that I can either record something directly into with a mic or just put in an instrument on its own with four empty submixes so that in case I need to route anything or print a stem on its own, I can easily move it into this stack and then make it its own stem. And that's what I did when the engineer requested that I put the bass guitar in its own separate stem, separate from the guitars. I just put the guitars in the wildcard stack, renamed it to bass guitars, routed everything appropriately, and then I was able to print it and it was not a problem. I didn't have to go through the process of creating a new stem, new submixes, new uh, effects tracks to send from the submixes to send to the stem and then route the stem all the way to the full mix track. And then all of that is mitigated because I have this all set up beforehand. Part of the pleasure of using this template is the flexibility that comes with it. So for example, here under the leads, arps and bass tracks, here are some leads that I use. This bottom track right here is called open. This is just an open track that's routed properly. If I want to uh, try finding another lead. I just will duplicate this track and go into my instrument library and start looking for more tracks. It's already routed appropriately to the proper submix, which is a routed to the whole stem, etc. So it's really easy to add new sounds if I find that I need something new or I'm just looking for more things. If I find a sound and it's just not working, I don't want to keep it in my template forever. I just delete it and it's gone forever. There's nothing that you have to do regarding uh, external routing. Pretty much all of the synth stacks have an open track so I can easily add more things. Now you may have noticed some of the naming includes some numbers to them. So let me break this down for you. There's a strict naming scheme to break down pretty much from the stem to the instrument, to the submix, to the effects on each of those levels. So as an example, 0, 100 woodwinds. This is the first stem. Now, the first submix is called 0, 101, winds long. The next, 0, 102, winds short. 0, 103, 0, 104. If you wanted to add more submixes for a stem, there's room in the naming scheme for you to go 0, 105, 0, 106, 0, 107, etc. If you needed to for example, you didn't want to use the longs shorts approach, but instead you went woodwinds high, woodwinds low. So you route the flutes and oboes to woodwinds high and bass clarinet and bassoons to woodwinds low, for example. Or in the brass stem, if you wanted to instead have the horns on their own submix and then high brass, low brass on their own submixes as well. You could easily rename these or add more submixes. Past the submixes, we go into 0, 1, 11, 0, 1, 12, 0, 1, 13, 0, 1, 14, and 0, 1, 15. These are all of the effects tracks. Here's a quick look at how every single stem is numbered and organized in terms of the naming scheme. Now, this would be a good time to show you what is past these instruments. So if I hit the H button on my keyboard, that will take all of these tracks out of hide. You'll see that there's a plethora of more tracks underneath here that are not visible when I'm just working normally. These are all of the print tracks. So you'll notice, let me zoom in a little bit here. This first track, print 0, 100, has a blue color to it. It is a folder holding 0, 100 wins stem. This woodwind stem is routed to this print track so that when you put this in record, it'll record all of the woodwind sounds on individually. Under that, you'll notice that I have each submix routed to its own print track so I can print just the submixes. You'll also notice that I have the same numbering scheme for each of these. So they're also color coded appropriately. So the woodwinds are this nice blue that the tracks themselves are colored as well. Brass is red, percussion is this brown color, and it keeps going after that. So everything is color coordinated. You can print just the stems if you want, or the stems and the submixes, or just the submixes, etc. All of the stem tracks, not the print tracks, but just the stems, all of these are routed to these full mix tracks. If you record this full mix, it will record all of the instruments that you have, excluding the dialogue, sound effects, and temp track, and the sketch tracks. 
those are not routed to the full mix track at all. It's only routed to the stereo output, so you can hear it, but it won't print at all. This full mix master track, basically you can put on your own mastering chain. So you can print maybe a track for a soundtrack if you want to put this up for an album or put it up as part of your portfolio on your reel or website or send it to a director or producer as a demo, you might want to master or bring up the, the volume of the overall track. And that's what this is for. The full mix is routed to the full mix master track. And then you can put in your effects on the full mix master track, print that on its own, and it'll be a mastered version very quick. There's also this click track. This is basically for the metronome. So under here, this last stack called utilities, you'll see a couple of things. Print 0001 clicks, one four. That stands for quarter note. These are basically just a bunch of little audio files with a metronome click sound every on every quarter note. If you have this set up, you can press record on this print click track and it'll print the whole metronome. So if you need to print out your click, you can do that super easily as well. In this utilities folder, there's also what's called a sync plop. There's a little audio file here, which is just like a bleep that is routed, as you can see here, to pretty much all of the stems. This sync plop is routed to plop two, which then is routed back to the rest of the instruments so that you can hear that plop sound at the beginning of every single cue. This is used for maybe sync purposes. This plop, uh, you can say in the file name where this is supposed to start, that plop will be heard. Or if you find that you're printing out all of the stems, each stem has a plop in the beginning, plus several measures of silence before you come in and measure five. We'll talk about that too. So that things don't slip out of sync, there's always that plop that can be aligned to. In a recording context, this plop can just get everyone's attention so that by the time the metronome comes in, which you'll notice the clicks start on this first marker called count. There are two measures of count before the cue starts on measure five. When you're recording a MIDI track, you can also just use this count section, if you will, to change MIDI CC information like expression or modulation and things like that before the actual uh, music starts. The reason the music starts at measure five is because if you pull back the whole timeline, like if you pull this back, it'll take you before time and it'll give you negative bars. But when you're exporting, this is really confusing for the computer and for many different programs. So let's talk about a little bit of, about how this is laid out in this way. This pre-roll is just when recording starts. There isn't necessarily music that's supposed to happen here. The count is when the metronome comes in, in terms of recording. And then cue start right here is where the actual music itself happens. I just have a cue end marker at the very end on measure 33. No specific reason for that, I just did. You also notice here, I turned on this secondary ruler here so you can see the passage of time. So here at measure five, there's a one, that's hour one. This is one second, this is two seconds, three seconds, etc. The way I set that up was in the project settings under synchronization, have measure five be hour one, and this is customary in scoring that all of the pre-roll and such be before hour one, and then you count from hour one out in terms of how the movie is supposed to be played. Now, I mentioned earlier that I suggested getting to the sketch track by pressing the number three. This is because I have a few different screen sets set up for different parts of the workflow when I'm scoring. This first screen set is called workflow. In this screen set, I have it set up to open my main project window, open the mixer down here, and I have my laptop down here running everything, and then an external monitor up here. The external monitor is what I use to look at the full project, and then I use my laptop screen for secondary windows. So if you have two monitors as well, this would automatically set up for, for you. For this workflow screen, I have the mixer set up because I will go in here and add effects and such like that. I don't consider that part of the mixing process necessarily, but part of the creative composition side because that's part of it. I also have the piano roll up here and ready to go. So once I have 
a track laid out, I can easily edit it on this second window without having to open something else in my main project window so I can still see everything. That's screen set number one. So if I press number two on my keyboard, that'll launch me into my second screen set, which I call scene mapping. This has enlarged global tracks. So a humongous marker section, signature, and an even bigger tempo section. On my second screen here, I have a few lists open. All of the markers here on the side, the tempo event list, and all of the signatures as well down here. This screen set, scene mapping, is specifically for when you're starting off a queue on a project, mapping out what the tempo changes are gonna be, what markers and events in the scenes that you need to hit, all of that stuff is what this section is for. So say you had, you were looking at a movie here, um, can add markers, this marker, the character jumps on the sofa. Now over here at around 15 seconds, this character is falling down the stairs and then a couple of seconds later they land what you can do from here is watching the scene you can alter the tempo as you need it and add time changes if you need to so for example here so at this section maybe i might want to make a two four measure right here and then at this measure turn it into a six four measure so that this marker lands on the downbeat and then on the downbeat, we go back to 4-4. Four, four. Very easy to add these markers, these signatures, and change the tempo as I need to. After the scene mapping screen set, if you press number three on your keyboard, that'll take you into the sketch screen set. So you'll notice that I have all of the same markers and signatures that I added from my scene mapping section, but scene mapping was specifically just to map out the entire scene. I'm not writing music yet. That's what the sketch screen set is for. I just unmute this track and I have automatically loaded up a piano sound. The piano sounds like this. In my opinion, this is a really nice sounding uh, piano track and there are four tracks here. So that, so that you can start composing and hit all of your markers, the tempo changes, everything as you need to. On my second monitor here, I have a score window and a piano roll up here. There are, there's basically a treble and a bass clef for each of the sketch tracks that makes to eight staves in total. I think that's plenty of tracks for you to get down initial ideas that you might want to apply to the whole cue without the overwhelming feeling of all of the tracks staring at you in the face. I know that in a few templates, there are sketch sections that people like to use, but I liked creating a separate screen set and a separate sort of project within a project. So you only see four tracks and that's all you have pretty much that you need to focus on without going to the instrument you want, scrolling around to find it, turning it on, waiting for it to load up, and then only putting down one line at a time. Just go ahead and put all of the lines that you are thinking of into a sketch track and then orchestrate it later. But have the idea down and change it as you need to to follow the scene in the sort of map that you laid out in scene mapping. This is sort of what these screen sets are for to facilitate that kind of workflow. After this, screen set number four is orchestrate. So orchestrate basically is, I have all of the sketch staves here on the score window. I can select notes and then paste them onto different tracks here in the piano roll or here in the uh, arrange window or be looking at the sketch score window and then playing in parts. And this is basically taking everything from the, that I wrote in my sketch and putting it onto the full score project, if you will. Once I'm done with that, then I just go back to screen set number one to the workflow screen set. I can mute this if I don't need to hear the sketch anymore. And then I can continue working from my initial sketch, but you shouldn't feel obligated to adhere directly to what your scene mapping or sketch was. In fact, in the sketch screen set, the global tracks are slightly enlarged to sort of encourage you to change things that you may want to change now that you're actually writing music to it. Scene mapping is just so that you're focused not on music, but focus on the actual storytelling of it. So that's why 
the instrument tracks aren't in focus, but the global tracks and their lists are. This is sort of an old fashioned way of working. In the old days, a MIDI composer would really have to take great care in thinking of how they were going to score the scene. They had to know how long the music was going to be. They would have all kinds of calculations that they would do in order to figure out the length of time that they have. They divide out how many bars they have, um, what hit points they need to hit, what hit points they need to accent in the music, etc. And then they get to writing to fit what the scene is. So this is sort of a, a way of doing that in modern scoring. Finally, the fifth screen set is called printing. This screen set is specifically for printing all of the tracks. So each print stack folder is open and I can easily record maybe all of the stems. Usually when I hit record on one stem, it turns all of the other ones on, but maybe that's a bug in this version of Logic Pro where the groups aren't really working. As you, as you see here, this stems group is supposed to enable record if I press record on one of them. And I can see here that this is part of the stems group. But anyway, that's supposed to happen. I put in whatever I need to record. I take this out of cycle, take it to the beginning, record. You hear the plop sound and then Let's see, so if I had, for example, some strings that I wanted to record, I come down here to the green, I turn on the string stem, say I had some pads, say I had some harp and keys, and I wanted to record the full mix. So here I go, press record, you hear the plop sound, four measures of rest, and then I measure five, the music would start because that's where the, the music is the, all of the music is starting. I just let it continue recording over the course of the entire queue. After that, I would right click, export as audio file. The naming scheme I follow is where the full queue name has underscores and separators. So for these prints, you'll notice that I added underscores to separate each, not only the numbering for the stem, but also what it's called, and then the word stem so that person knows just looking at the file name what exactly it is. So here for the file name recipe, I have the project name, which would be the full queue, then an underscore, and then the region name, which in this case would be the name of the stems, again, separated with underscores. So when I export that, all of the tracks that I printed would be named exactly appropriately what they need to be. So let me go ahead and delete these because I don't need them. I'm going to delete for all. You might also notice in the side here, I have the audio files basically showing up here. This looks like there's a, an extraneous audio file that was recorded initially. I don't need this, so I'll just delete it. And so I have this open, so I keep track of what audio files I have in this project. So I don't lose track in case there's an extraneous thing. I also have the mixer open my second window in case I want to add or change or affect anything before I print. Speaking of printing, like I said, the full mix here, all of the stems are routed to this full mix. This full mix is then sent, as you can see here, to the mastered track. This full mix mastered is what this track is routed to. And then the full mix is routed to the mix monitor track, as well as the mastered is routed to the mastered monitor track. These two tracks are routed to the stereo output. So these monitor tracks are just for you to hear what the mix or the master is specifically. These don't print out. So you'll see the mastered track is muted by default. For 90% of your workflow, this will always stay muted. It's only when you want to hear what the master sounds like that you have to mute the mix and then unmute the mastered track. So remember that. There are all kinds of little settings that I have applied in this template. For example, in this workflow section, the piano roll has the automation lane already up and, and running. The only way that you can have it to automatically have it open each time you open the piano roll is if you have the screen set and you lock it. So that's what that little dot means. If I unlock this, then I can change something. For example, take off the automation in the piano roll down here, my second monitor, and then I lock it again. So let me just get out of the screen set, back to the workflow screen set, 
you'll notice that, that Piano Roll doesn't have the automation lane open anymore. So in order to make that work, I have to unlock this, make my change, and then lock it again. So each time I recall this screen set, it looks exactly the way it was when I saved it. Pedal markings are turned off by default in the score window. That was so if you're sketching something out in the sketch screen set, and then you're orchestrating it in the orchestrate screen set that you don't see a, a bunch of pedal markings cluttering up the score. That I just found that to be extraneous. So I turned that off for the score window. MIDI chase is enabled in the preferences. MIDI chase is so that if you're in the middle of a long MIDI note, the playback will catch up from what that MIDI note is supposed to be and play it. You might have run into the thing where you're playing from the middle of a project, for example, and it happens to be in the middle of a MIDI note and the note just doesn't play back. So MIDI chase enabled in the preferences allows this to happen. The mixer window also has a few preferences set. So I have the mixer to follow track stacks. That means if you open a stack in the main window, it'll open it in the mixer as well. However, I don't have it set to follow hide. So all of the hidden tracks are here in the mixer as well. In the main project window, the effects tracks. So these like the reverbs and these effects tracks are not shown by default. If I take the main window out of hide, you'll see these effects tracks pop up. However, uh, since I have the mixer set up so that it shows me every hidden track, I don't use the hide function in this project window. If I want to access the print tracks, I just press screen set five. It'll unhide everything and then show me all of the print tracks. That's how I've set it up. Again, if you want to alter one of these screen sets, you have to unlock it first, make your changes, then lock it again. So it recalls exactly the layout that you pulled up. Okay. So that's it. For this video, if you're curious about something, then go ahead and ask me in the comments down below. But like I said, routing and mixing are coming next week or in the next video if you're watching this in the future. Stay tuned for that because I'm sure many of those questions that you have on how exactly instruments are routed to submixes, which are routed, which are sent to FX tracks which are both sent to stems, which are sent to full mix, which is sent to a mix monitor and a mix print track. And then mix is sent to mastered and then mastered. And it, it, it gets messy, but that requires its own video. So that'll be all in depth later on. So don't worry. So until then, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Ernesto Composer. You can visit my Patreon at patreon.com slash Ernesto Composer, where you can get access to templates like this one if you want it score study versions of my own published works, score study Sunday hangouts every single month, and more goodies, you can visit my website at ernestocomposer.com. Thanks so very much for watching, and as always, take care.